Hello, my name is Marcia Skripik. I live in Brantford and I'm an author. I've written over 20 books, had over 20 books published, but I want to talk to you today about one of my books that's actually set in Brantford. So um, when it came out, it looked like this. It was called Stolen Child and that's what it looked like. But that was uh, 11 years ago. Uh, two years ago, it came out like this, Stolen Girl. And you're probably wondering why the title changed. Well, sometimes I wonder the same thing. Uh, the Stolen Child was the original Canadian edition, and then when it was picked up by Scholastic US and um, really the rest of the world in English, they changed the name to Stolen Girl, which is kind of weird because that was my original name for the title in the first place. And now everywhere that you look, it's called Stolen Girl. But this book, as I said, takes place in Canada and it takes place in the early 1950s. And I want to tell you why I wrote this book and why it's set in Brantford. So one of the reasons it's set in Brantford is because it was inspired by my mother-in-law who um, lived in Brantford after the war. She came to Canada after World War II. She was a refugee, as was my father-in-law, and they were refugees from Ukraine. And during World War II, they barely escaped with their lives. And they told me lots of stories. And I want to show you a picture of my mother-in-law when she was just a little kid. That's her in the middle. So when World War II started, um, my mother-in-law was a kid. And when the Nazis invaded, uh, they invaded her area of Ukraine. And they really liked her house. And they took over her house. And so she and her mother and father were prisoners in their own house. And it was a really terrifying time for her. And um, there was something that happened during that time that she didn't even tell her own kids, my um, husband or uh, my uh, uh, brother-in-law. Uh, they didn't know about this, but she told me about just a couple months before she died about what happened. And she said, I, I need to tell you this thing that happened. Um, and she said, and I think that you should write a book about it. So the thing that she told me is that when she was a, a kid and going to school and the Nazis were there, one day they overheard, like they would always listen through the wall to see what was going on because they were terrified. They didn't know whether they were going to live from one day to the next. And one day when she was listening through the wall, she and her parents, they heard that there was going to be an action at the school the next day. Now, let me tell you, if Nazis are going to do an action at your school, you don't want to be there, right? But if you are a prisoner in your own home and you're only allowed to go to school and come back and then you're supposed to, um, like, uh, wash and iron and make food and all that for the Nazis or be shot, like, do you go out and tell your friends that there's going to be a, an action? Like, do you actually even see your friends? And you don't know what that action is. So what her parents said was, you're staying home. You're just not going to school. So that's what she did. When she came back, two days later, went back to school, half of her classmates were missing. Now, I know that you're thinking, if I say, who were the classmates? You're going to say the Jewish classmates. They had already been taken. So this was another group of people who were being taken. This time, what it was, it was everybody who had blonde hair and blue eyes and looked... Um, German, according to the Nazis. Now, I'll show you my mother-in-law's picture again. You can see that she had brown hair and dark eyes. She had brown eyes. So even if she had gone, she would not have been taken. But she experienced huge guilt because she didn't tell her classmates that something was going on. She didn't know what was going on. But she lived with that guilt for the rest of her life. She never saw any of her classmates again. And even in a refugee camp, in the refugee camps she was in after the war, she never saw them again. Uh, and so uh, just a couple months before she died, that's when she called me up and she said, Marcia, you have written all these different books, all set during um, times of history that no one um, knew about. And you did all this research and then you wrote books about it. And you always pride yourself on writing on bits of history that no one else writes about. And she said, but you've never written what happened to me. And I said, it, it's partly because you never told me what happened to you. So I can't write about it if you keep it a secret. And so she, she did tell me that, but she, it still wasn't enough to write a book. And so I found out after doing research and talking to her a bit more about what had happened to those kids. 
And um, so they were put in this program called the Liebensborn program, which meant that the Nazis um, had decided uh, that some kids who were um, Polish and Ukrainian could be brainwashed into thinking they were German and they would capture them from their parents' families and um, brainwash them to make them think that their own parents weren't their parents. And then they were placed into German homes, not as um, adopted children, but basically as trophies. And like, this is a pretty horrific thing when you think about it. Um, and it was hard for me to even get my head around it. Um, but one of the things that they would do to capture kids, like in my mother-in-law's situation, it was just uh, uh, soldiers that came to the school and sorted them out like that. But there was another way that they would do it. They actually had a group of women uh, officers, Nazi officers, and they were dressed in brown suits and they were called the Brown Sisters. And they would uh, go to different, like maybe um, uh, on the street or whatever, they'd see a group of children and they would want to get a good look at them to see if they were worth stealing. And they would go up to them with candy. And remember that this is in the middle of the war and it was part of what was called the hunger plan at that point. So they had taken food away from people. Um, and so people were starving. So if you were a starving kid and someone came up to you and said, would you like some candy? You'd probably say yes, even though you should always say no to a stranger when they offer you candy. Well, they would offer candy so that they could get a really good look at the kids. And then they would decide whether they were going to capture them or not. And so in my book, Stolen Child or Stolen Girl, um, uh, two sisters are stolen like that. Um, they are uh, examined by the Brown sisters. And then two kids are stolen together, two sisters. And they're taken to this sorting facility because just because you had blonde hair and blue eyes didn't make you an Aryan. And also remember that the Nazis had this hierarchy of humans, as I'm sure that you know. And um, so if you were Jewish, that meant you were going to be killed. Um, if you were uh, um, Roma, or some people would call them back then, they called them gypsies, they would also be killed outright. Now, people who were Polish and Ukrainian were also to be killed, but instead of sent to concentration camps or something like that, they were generally starved or worked to death and uh, not as frequently. So um, they only wanted to kill four out of every five Ukrainian or Polish person, whereas the Nazis wanted to kill every single Jew and Roma in the world. Um, still not great. But anyways, um, the, the Nazis, when they did invade Eastern Europe and they saw Poles and Ukrainians who kind of looked like them, they thought this might be a waste of a lot of kids that we could salvage and make them fight for us um, and maybe fight their own parents ultimately instead of um, just killing them. And so that's why they started this Liebensborn program, this uh, brainwashing program. So my story, back to Brantford, um, I thought, what would happen if one of those kids who had been brainwashed was then rescued after the war? Um, but her brain, like she doesn't remember who she is, right? But she's rescued after the war and she's finally in a place of safety um, and so she would start to have the memories come back. But also remember, she was stolen with a sister. So they had to be tested, the two of them together. And so what happened was they were taken to this testing facility that was um, an old castle. It had been stolen from a Jewish family and now had been repurposed into this hospital where um, uh, nurses and doctors would look at every single kid and measure 64 individual things about them. So like the shape or the length of their nose, the um, uh, proportion of their forearm compared to their legs, all these different things. If you had a single freckle, you failed. So there were two sisters, uh, Lida uh, and Larissa, and Lida, the older one, failed the test and Larissa passed the test. So what that meant was they had different fates. So uh, Lita ended up, she was called a not valuable human being. So she was sent for slave labor and she became the um, heroine in this book, Making Bombs for Hitler, which is actually my best known book. And it's had, I don't even know how many editions, like it's got about nine or 10 different covers, but this is the most recent cover because they keep on changing it. Um, but then the sister who was um, considered uh, um, a valuable human being, this is her in Stolen Girl. That's uh, 
Larissa, but if you've been brainwashed, she didn't even know that her name was Larissa anymore. So for a while it was Gretchen. And then when she was captured again and saved and brought to a, a displaced persons camp, a refugee camp, and then ended up in Bramford, she is given a different name again because she's forgotten her first name and her second name. Um, and so now she's called Nadia. So this story opens up with Nadia, with this woman who calls herself her mother, but she knows it's not her mother, but she knows that she's safe with her. And they come to Brantford and they come through the Brantford uh, train station. They come on the train. And so this is something that you can do, actually, is you can as a, um, like just a, sort of like a little quest. You can find all the different things that are in Stolen Girl that are in Brantford. So they arrive at the Brantford train station. And here's a picture. Brantford train station was actually built in, I think it was 1910. It was around 1910. It was finished just before the First World War. And she's arriving in about 1951. So it still kind of looked like that. So she came there and um, her adoptive father picks them up in a borrowed car. And when she gets into the back seat of the car, she smells the, the, the scent of the leather from the car. And all of a sudden she has this flash of memory and she doesn't know where to put it, but it was this memory of being in another car sometime in the past and she doesn't know why, she doesn't know who the driver was, she doesn't know where she was going. So then they end up going, um, to, uh, Yvonne is her uh, father, her, her adoptive father, and Marussia is her adoptive mother. And they go to where a lot of um, immigrants after World War II went in Brantford, which was Sheridan Street. And he hasn't been able to, the um, parents, adoptive parents haven't been able to afford a house, but they bought a lot and Yvonne has been building a lot, uh, a house on this lot. Now, when I say Yvonne, the way that that's spelt is I-V-A-N. And a lot of people would pronounce that Ivan, but in Ukrainian, it's Yvonne. So he has been building a house. But when um, Marussia and uh, um, Nadia arrive from the refugee camp and coming across the ocean and then a train and everything and they arrive, the house isn't built yet. It's only halfway built. And that actually happened. A lot of refugees who came after the war, they would buy the property first and then they basically built the house up around them because they didn't have enough money to buy a house. So they would like build their house one plank of wood at a time as they could afford it. And so that's based on um, actual refugees that I interviewed in the Brantford area. Um, so the other thing is, is, so she's on Sheridan Street. So she only, she speaks uh, Ukrainian and she speaks Russian, Yiddish, German, but she doesn't speak much English and she needs to learn English. And so one of the places that she spends a lot of time in is the Brantford Public Library. Now, the original Brantford Public Library is not where it is now. When I was a kid, that library was actually a Woolworth store. I used to go there and get um, uh, ice cream sundaes. It was a great place. And then they changed it. Um, it was Woolco Woolworths. And then they changed it to the library. But for her, it would have been the Carnegie Building, which is now Laurier Brantford. So she would have gone when it looked like this. And when she goes into the library in Brantford, a lot of the books that she ends up getting were books that I got when I was a kid. Now, I'm not old enough to have lived through World War II. I'm old. I'm 66. But um, I was born in 1954. The war ended in 1945. So I'm not old enough, right? But a lot of the books that I was reading then, like, you know, when I was 10 years old or nine years old, were the same books that she would have read. And also because she's learning English. And when I was a kid, I had difficulty reading. I am dyslexic. I now consider this my secret weapon and my gift and why I'm able to write the books that I do. But when I was a kid, it was really hard for me to read. And so I would only read a certain kind of book and it had to put a movie into my head. And so I knew the kinds of books that she would read too. So she was reading Freddy the Pig, for example, which was um, a series of books that I loved. It was about this talking pig. It was really good. I, you know, and also I read Black Beauty. So she looks and finds 
Black Beauty. So um, it's kind of neat because that's the Brantford Public Library. And a lot of the scenes that are in that book are about um, uh, my own um, recollection of learning how to read. So um, the other thing is, is that she would have gone to Central School. And do you remember Central School in Brantford um, is not the original building. So the one that you see now is not the same one that she would have seen. This is what it would have looked like. Now, you should really do some research on Central School because that place and the older building and the older building before it has really interesting history. So you should do that. And actually, Brantford has a really interesting history in a lot of the old buildings. But the other thing, do you remember I told you about how the Brown sisters would get these kids captured and then they would take them to this sorting facility that was like a hospital built in an old castle? Did you know that we have a castle in Brantford? So um, my girl, um, Nadia, one of the times she's walking with a friend of hers that lives on Buffalo Street and she, they end up turning the corner and going on Usher Street. And on Usher Street, there is a castle. It's called Yates Castle, or it's called Winarden Castle. And I've got a picture of it too. It's there now. And I think that you should go and find it because in the winter is the very best time to find it because if you try and find it in the summer, all you see are all these trees around it. But this was a castle and it was built by Frank Yates and he actually owned the railway company um, like in the 1800s and he wanted to have a castle like an old fashioned English cat country castle on a hill. And so that's why Terrace Hill is called Terrace Hill because he wanted this castle on a terraced hill, which means like um, gardens all the way down like that. And then he had his castle. But you go and look at it and it's pretty um, neat looking, but also creepy looking, especially if you are Nadia, who has been taken to a castle in her past that she doesn't remember, where she was brainwashed and she lost her sister. So when she is with her friend Linda, who lives on Buffalo Street, which is right around that area, and they pass this castle, she totally freaks out. Like she has sort of like a meltdown. And then a lot of the memories that she has come rushing back to her. But again, they're not really in order and she can't really understand them because it's almost like, you know, like if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and say your brother or sister is doing a jigsaw puzzle and yours is um, ballerinas around the world and um, your sister is doing one that's trees of North America and there's thousand pieces each and say the two of you bumped into each other and all of these like just splashed all over the place and they're all mixed up. And then another, um, your mother um, was doing what, one that was 2,000 pieces and it dumps all over the place. And it's, I don't know, it's cakes of the world or something. Well, can you imagine trying to sort that out, sort out three sets of memories, all in little jigsaw pieces and try and figure out which one goes to which life and everything else? Well, that's what she's stuck doing. She, um, as she's remembering these things, she remembers meeting Hitler face to face for one thing which just absolutely freaks her out. You can imagine how scary that would be. But she also remembers um, like living on this farm and having food, but then she remembers another time when she had no food and she remembers having a sister, but then she remembers having a different sister. So her all her memories are like this jigsaw puzzle that's been mixed with two others and, and just made into a mess. Um, but that castle, it has a, like a huge impact on jolting her memory and helping her remember all that stuff. So um, the book is historical fiction, but it's also written as a mystery because it's like peeling back layers of her memory. And I, when I write a book, I always like to think of the shape of the book. And for me, Stolen Girl is shaped like an onion. And that's because you begin the book with the outside surface, everything, like just what's going on. And as the story goes on and as she's living through day-to-day -day life in Brantford, Ontario, Canada, um, she remembers more and more and more. And so the end of the book is really like the middle of the onion. 
Um, this book has been uh, published in many different languages and many different forms. So it's available in audiobook. And in fact, I think you can get it in audiobook from the Brantford Public Library. But it also has some really cool different um, versions. So this is this is what it looks like in French, Enfant Voli. This is the Korean edition. And um, these flowers all here, these are lilacs because that plays a really important role in the story. It helps her remember because the scent of lilacs brings back memory as well. This is one of my favorite editions. This is the Chinese edition. So this is cool. See this picture right here? That's Yates Castle in Brantford, Ontario. How um, the Chinese illustrator for the cover of my book visualized this here. So I think that that in itself is really neat. Now, don't ask me to read from this book because I don't read Chinese. This is the Portuguese edition right there. And one thing that gets me frustrated about the Portuguese edition is that I like put in Google Translate the title of this book because I don't read Portuguese. And it said that what this book is called is Diary of a Young Girl Stolen. This is not a diary. This is a mystery. It's a historical mystery. It's not a diary. Do you know the difference between a diary and uh, a mystery or a novel? They're not the same thing, right? So people who then review it, like they go on Amazon and various places, and they, they would only give me three out of four stars if they were reading the Portuguese edition because they said, it's not a diary. It's, it's a mystery. It's historical. And I'm going, yes. Don't blame me, blame the person who named the book in Portuguese. But anyways, the thing is, is that when you're an author, you don't get to choose things like the title of your book. So I could stop right there, but I'm not going to, because one of the things that I want to share with you is my website. It's Kala.com. Now, I know that's a weird website, but my name is Marsha Forchuk Skripik. Do you really want to have to figure out how to find a website called Marsha Forchuk Skripik? I don't think so. Kala, I, I got that because when I was married, I carried Kala lilies in my wedding bouquet. And uh, flower uh, websites are easy to remember. And I got that website in 1998, and it was probably the last flower website that was a flower.com website left. So ha, I was really happy to get it. Many people keep on trying to buy it from me, but nobody's getting it because that's mine. But if you don't, if you don't remember about Kala.com, that's okay because just put in my last name, Skripik, uh, Google it, and my website will come up and my books will come up. But on my website, there's a whole bunch of really um, good stuff. So one of the things that I have on my website, um, and you just have to go to the website and then put in the little search bar lullaby, there's um, in uh, Stolen Girl, uh, there's a lullaby that uh, Nadia remembers from her original life. And she doesn't even know that she's singing it to herself in Ukrainian because she was brainwashed and speaking German. And then again, she's, she's speaking Ukrainian and English. But she, she didn't realize that this was um, a lullaby in Ukrainian. But a couple of years ago, I was visiting a school that was a Ukrainian um, uh, immersion school, like English and Ukrainian in Toronto. And when I got to the school, they had um, taken the music for that lullaby and their uh, grade five teacher taught all the kids the song. So they sang it to me. And so I said, can you record that? And I'll put it on my website. So you can listen to the actual lullaby that um, uh, Larissa uh, sang to herself and then sang to herself also when she was Gretchen, not even realizing what she was singing. And it was also a song that her sister in Making Bombs for Hitler would um, sing to her. And also in Making Bombs for Hitler, it's a really um, important uh, symbol uh, because uh, it's something that Lida comforts other captives with because it's a bunch of kids who are captured by the Nazis and forced to do things like make bombs and other horrible things. And if they don't do that, then they're, being, they're going to be killed. So um, that's pretty much it. I guess I should show you the picture of my most recent book, which is Trapped in Hitler's Web. 
and this is part of a new series. So actually, Stolen, Stolen Girl, Making Bombs for Hitler, um, is part of a trilogy. Let me see if I can find the third book in the trilogy. Come here, come here, come here. Where did it go? The other one, well, I, I've, here's the, um, here's the Canadian version. So it's Underground Soldier, but it's also The War Below. So this and Making Bombs for Hitler, that's one trilogy. They're all connected. And then I have an, another trilogy as well. So it's Don't Tell the Nazis, but it was also published as Don't Tell the Enemy because this whole Canadian-American different title thing. And then the second book, they finally gave me the same title in both countries, and it's called Trapped in Hitler's Web. And the third book is coming out in the fall of this year, and it's called uh, Traitors Among Us. And I'm right now writing a book that will be published in 2022. When you write, you write way in advance. So... Um, it takes about six months for me to write a first draft of a novel. It takes three or four or five years to do the research before I ever start. And then once I do the first draft, then I'm working with an editor. And between the editor and myself, it can take six months to a year to do the um, polished version. There's all different sorts of revisions that you have to do. So I'm just going to give you a little piece of advice too. If you are interested in writing or even if you're just interested in doing better stories or essays for school, do not think that you can do anything in one draft. It's going to be terrible, okay? Um, it's going to be not nearly as good as what you can do if you um, do revisions. So for me, any given book, I probably do about a thousand revisions and I'm a published author. So why do you think that you could do it in one? You can't, okay? The other thing is it's always a good idea to get um, suggestions from someone else. So if you've got a good friend and you can swap essays or stories and um, get feedback back and forth, it will help you. And it doesn't mean that you have to agree with all the things that they say, but um, the very fact of hearing someone else's thoughts on your story will really help your writing a lot. And if you are interested in being a writer, I'm gonna give you two tips, okay? Number one tip is read a lot. So if, you're, if you wanna be a writer, don't think that you can like read three books and then be a writer. Um, consider having a goal of reading a thousand books, all different, okay? That will give you the background and the understanding of how many different kinds of writing there is. And then you can go and start writing. The other thing that you should do, though, is start to write today. Ten minutes every single day. And this is not for your teacher and it's not for your parents. It's not for anyone. It's, it's just for you. And you can write it in a journal if you want. But if you spend ten minutes every single day writing, by the end of the year, you will have something that is book length. It's not necessarily going to be a book but it'll be the size of a book, okay? And also, just like if you were going to be a runner, you wouldn't all of a sudden run 30 kilometers. Um, you have to build up to it, right? You have to build your muscles. With writing, it's the same thing. You need to build your writing muscles. So if you write for 10 minutes every day, you will be building your imagination, you will be changing your brain into a writer's brain, and you will be building your writing muscles. And on that note, bye, happy reading, and um, it was great to chat with you.